Our Western civilization is almost unique, I think, in terms of the, uh, the time span. I mean, when we think of Homer, that's 27 centuries ago, and there he is writing the Iliad, throwing that down and saying, OK, now match that, which we don't think we've ever really done. Um, so, you know, to go back so far, and I'm speaking, for example, uh, about Greek drama. Well, that's 5th century, fifth century BC. Um, so that's quite an extraordinary thing, that those works are still there and still relevant to people and um, still something that we might try to match. The other thing I think is that it's, it's, it's been a prolonged argument really uh, within itself uh, between um, the absolutes of say um, uh, Christian or Judaic um, uh, received ideas which are absolute and revealed and um, a long, long tradition, which is classical, I suppose, uh, of um, experiment, of question, of hypothesis and dispute. Um, and that's a wonderful tension that has created all sorts of interesting, uh, sometimes dangerous, sometimes murderous um, conflicts, but nevertheless, means that the thing keeps growing and keeps looking at itself and becoming something new. I think there are people both inside and outside the culture um, who look at some things that have happened. I mean, we happen to have lived in one of the most murderous uh, centuries in the whole time the Western civilizations existed. Uh, and I'm thinking of things like the First World War, uh, the Second World War, um, the, um, the Holocaust, uh, the numbers of people who died, you know, in Marxist and other kind of political camps. And they ask themselves, what is it in this civilization uh, that at the highest point of consciousness in the civilization, uh, has allowed these things to happen. Uh, and so many of them that have happened um, are not the results of pure barbarism at all, but um, the results of a kind of mistaken idealism, but absolutism. And I think they're genuine questions to ask about the civilization. It's not the first time it happened. And they also died not just out of a kind of um, wish for barbarism or a willingness to practice barbarism, but from a kind of mistaken idealism uh, with an absolute belief that this was necessary for a kind of better future. Now, that's not entirely unique. If you go back to the 17th century and earlier, you see the Spanish Inquisition doing something like that in Italy and Spain and its colonies in the Thirty Years' War. Um, in the witch trials of the 17th century. I think the education system is in some ways um, to blame for the fact that um, uh, children at school are not as we were when I was at school, but that's 70 years ago, um, presented with some of the richness uh, of the culture you know, in terms of things like Greek myths and Aesop's fables, as well as poems and all the rest of it. So they, they grow up um, not being aware of the richness of the culture. I mean, what they think uh, the culture is, is what it, they're now presented with, which is games, social media, and all the rest of it. Um, so I think we have to be very careful to um, present the wholeness of the culture to people from quite early on. It's too late when they've gone to university or saying, oh, they'll, they'll discover that when they're adults. I think you have to begin early with all of that. And I think we've been remiss in that. And when I was, again, go back to my own education, the notion 
really was that uh, you took a synoptic view of the culture. That is, uh, there were all sorts of things that were closely related. So we, for example, if you studied uh, at university English literature, you did, Amer you did uh, French literature at the same time, you did philosophy at the same time, you did history, and you realised that all of these things were connected. Um, and I think that large view um, is necessary to us. We can fill the details in later or we can um, decide to specialise in something later. But even when we specialise, we need to know how that is connected to some longer arc. And I think we've sometimes lost that um, because the culture, as I said, uh, goes all the way back 27 centuries uh, to Homer. And um, we have to cling to the belief that that beginning is still part of what we have and what we are going to carry into the future. The classical world is where we started. And what has happened really over the history is that sometime around the sixth century, uh, we lost contact with that. That was partly because um, Christianity, I think, at that time didn't believe that the pagan world had anything to offer it. Uh, it waited 800 years and then it came back. And once it did, I think we saw that the achievements of that world, not only in literature, but in um, a, a government, in civil rights, uh, in notions of citizenship, in technology, um, had a great deal to teach us. And a lot of the, the ways of learning from that was to uncover it again and see what their methods were. So I would say that from the 13th century onwards, um, we have had a very strong sense of our continuity with that Roman and Greek world. Uh, and a lot of that has guided us. And sometimes it's been in conflict with Christian values. Mostly it hasn't been. It, we, we discovered that those two things can uh, communicate with one another and cooperate with one another. But I would say that for, from the, certainly from the 17th and 18th century on with the beginning of the Enlightenment, um, the classical world has been our, almost our chief guide. Uh, certainly to things like um, uh, how our society works and to the institutions we want to create to make that work. I'm particularly interested recently um, in Greek drama, uh, but especially the role of women in Greek drama. Uh, and if you look at a lot of the stories that are taken up and which the Greek dramatists had to deal with, there were ones in which women had very little voice and very little agency. And what they do uh, by giving women that voice and agency, it allows them to criticise their society as they would not have been able to do without that. They can criticise it from within uh, and um, I mean, a lot of the Greek thinking is about exactly that, about continually questioning and criticising and argument in the drama and um, eloquent debate uh, and persuasion is what they are largely about. So those two worlds, uh, which exist absolutely in communion with one another in households, in the bed, um, the dramatists see as a, a wonderful place where you can get two views uh, and play them off one against another. Remarkable, because the only people who are doing this are men, uh, although women are always in the audience, uh, but also because the players are also men. And so there's that game being played that the men are standing there and speaking with the voice of women and getting inside the consciousness of women as actors do, but as writers do, in a 
wonderfully challenging and revealing way. The, the remarkable thing, of course, is that these plays, when we see them, um, still excite us, still shock us, still touch us, still um, make us feel that they're talking for problems which we understand. Um, I think that's something which we know is possible because we have in this language, and again, we, we need to think always that the culture exists differently in different languages. We know it from inside our language by the sense that if anybody said, who is the greatest contemporary dramatist, most of us would say Shakespeare, um, because we can go back and back and back to those plays and find they still speak directly to us. I think the Greek drama is still, it speaks to us in that way. I wrote an essay six or seven years ago uh, called Made in England, uh, and what's central to that is that we have been very fortunate here in having inherited a highly sophisticated political system which was a thousand years in the making and which we got, you know, 150 years ago and which we have preserved and in some ways made improvements in. Uh, I think most people would agree that that is still the most successful working political system there is. Uh, when you look around the world, there's not many places that can say we have 150, 200, 300 years in which power has been passed from one administration to another without violence. And um, I don't think people doubt that. Um, but I think people are made uncomfortable by the fact that it, um, it seems almost parochial uh, or to be so British as to um, f say that to ourselves. I think we have to challenge that notion. You don't destroy uh, things that have taken so long to make and have worked so well for so long um, uh, just because you feel uncomfortable about where it first began or where you first began. <laughs>